So just, just quickly, first of all, on, um, you know, why creativity? And I talked a little bit about that. And, you know, to me, it's, it's a really about having ideas and, and without ideas, as the quote says there from De Bono, um, neither organisations or the individuals within them will reach any sort of fulfilment. Um, you know, whereas human beings actually love being, being creative. And so, you know, we, we, we get depressed when we're not being creative. And I guess you could say our organisations and economies become depressed, so to speak, when we're not being creative. And it's, it's not just, you know, the creative department, the design department or the marketing department who needs to be creative or have skills in creativity. It's, it's everybody, whether you're in the, the front office, the middle office, the back office, or um, these days even the home office. Before I get into the, the five barriers of creativity, we can um, think of creativity as a process. Um, creativity actually loves a bit of structure. So, you know, for argument's sake, here's a, here's a, protest, a process for creativity. Um, but even with the best processes in the world, what we often find is there's a number of barriers that, that get in the way between the stages and in the stages and, and stop us unleashing our creativity. And that's what I want to touch on today what those barriers are and how to overcome them. So the, the five barriers that we'll, we'll go through and how to overcome those are our beliefs or our attitudes, um, our brain and how our brain works, our behaviours, our state, so what state we're in, and also um, space, which is closely linked to obviously what we are talking about before in terms of the incubator. So jumping straight into, into beliefs. So the thing is, is we pretty much go through, go through our life having um, creativity drummed out of us. So by the time we become adults, we no longer believe we're creative. Whereas if you think back to when you're a child, um, you know, you're highly creative, whether it was through craft or through drawing or um, imaginary play. There's a great example, um, from Gordon McKenzie, who's the author of Orbiting the Giant Hairball, which is a, a fantastic little book to read. And um, when he was giving back to the community, what he'd do is he'd travel around the schools and run craft classes. And um, he tells a story as he'd go into like kindergarten or year one, and he goes, who's creative here? And, you know, everybody's putting their hand up. Um, and then, you know, by the time he gets to you know, year seven or eight, there's only one or two hands going up. And then by the time he, he gets to year 12, there might be, you know, one closet creative hiding down the back too, too ashamed to admit that they're creative. So this is sort of, you know, what happens as we go through, unfortunately, school and society and, and business. So the, the key really um, with this, this first, first barrier is um, actually to suspend judgment that we're not creative um, and start relearning the skills of creativity so we can unleash um, that creativity that is hidden within us. I use the analogy of um, if you just take running for example, um, I could go and get some training to, to run faster or sprint faster. Now, I may not get to the Olympics, but I'd still become faster. So yes, while some of us are naturally creative, we can all learn to be, to be even more creative. So the first, the first barrier we actually tackle by going around it and working on the other four barriers. But to do that, you really need to let go of that um, belief that you're not creative and then start applying the tools of creativity. Have some successes, have some wins, and that'll help build creative confidence. So if you just run with that thought for now, while I go through the next four. So I want to touch with um, on the brain first, obviously plays a, a big part in our lives. So the brain is a, a fantastic thing and it's like a massive storage device. Some of you on this webinar are probably too young to remember um, or even know what a filing cabinet is. Um, but a filing cabinet is where, you know, you store lots of information, much like you do in your files on your desktop. 
So how the brain works is it's very linear and analytical. So every experience in life gets stored in your brain, which is really good. Because imagine if every morning when you got up, you had to rethink how to get dressed or how to have breakfast or how to get to school or how to get to work or you know, even how to cross the road. So the brain's fantastic like that. But what it means is that when you want to think of something new, it's really hard. When you want to be creative, it's really hard. Because if you try and think up of a new idea, your brain's going to go back to one of those experiences you've already had. So it's not new, it's old. So if I said to you right now, think of a new idea for an ice cream, your brain, unless you trick it, is automatically going to start thinking of what can be in a cone, it can be in a cup, it could be um, vanilla, strawberry, raspberry. So it just comes up with things you already know. So you've actually got to trick it. So you might go, okay, what's the problem with ice cream? Well, on a hot day, so not like today in Sydney, ice cream melts. And then you go, well, what else is really good at keeping things cool or cold? And you might think, okay, it's got another part of our brain. Um, I like to keep my beer cold. How do I do that? And you might do that through a beer cooler. So then you go, okay, well, let's take that idea and take that to ice cream. What if we created a beer cooler type thing for our ice cream? Yeah, it might be a rubbish idea, but it's just an example of how we have to, we have to trick our brains. So this is the term that De Bono coined, lateral thinking. So you've got to provide that stimulus or inspiration or provocation to trick your brain to go into a different file so you come up with new ideas. So stimulus is the raw material of our creativity. And these can come from so prior experiences, so drawing on all those experiences in our brains, but about different categories or industries and things. New experiences, so actually going out and getting some fresh new stimulus or using creative exercises. So I'll give you a couple of practical examples today on each of those. So first of all, if we think about our lives, you know, often we do the, the same thing every day or up until probably six weeks ago we did. Same commute, we read the same news stories. You know, we probably spend most of our time with people from similar backgrounds. And often what that means is we often settle for the first good idea we have. And if we really thought about it, many of our ideas could be copied from out by our competitors. Um, and if we're really honest with ourselves, most of our ideas will be quite incremental rather than revolutionary. So the key, one of the keys to creativity is staying fresh. So you've always got, I guess, fresh new files in your filing cabinet to draw on. So if you think about things now within COVID-19, it's really important to stay fresh as well. So we're not getting bored and depressed at home. So, you know, maybe in the mornings you try a different walking circuit or a different ex exercise routine. You know, how do you change up breakfast? If you're a cereal person, do a cooked breakfast. If you're a cooked breakfast person, you know, maybe do a cereal or something else. Or try breakfast, you know, from different, from different countries. Start listening and reading, you know, to different material than what you normally do. So they're just the different examples of how you can keep boosting your freshness within your brain. But now I want to talk about some other ones. So new experiences. Um, right now we're not allowed to travel, so we can't go to Greece. Um, but we actually did some work a few years ago with a supermarket chain in, in the UK called Sainsbury's. And they really wanted to, within their bakery section and produce, own the concept of freshness and the positioning of freshness. So what we did is we got the Sainsbury's team all together. Um, we all met up early in the morning in central London. Um, we gave everyone uh, the um, London underground maps and the A to Z guide. So this was a few years ago before we had iPhones. And we got people to go around London into different businesses, different stores, and that, that did freshness really well because we're looking for inspiration. And we went into a fishmonger, so a fish shop. And we said to them, well, how do you do freshness? And they said, well, we only buy our fish fresh every day from day boats. We're like, well, what's a day boat? And they go, well, day boats go out every morning, catch their fish, and then come home every, every day, and we buy from them. Whereas other boats like deep sea trawlers, 
may go out for many weeks at a time. And the fish, while it's okay, it, it's frozen for several weeks and it comes back frozen we, and that would be sold frozen. So we were like, okay, so what could we do? What if Sainz we started baking daily? What if we only bought produce, produce um, that was local and things like that? So this was before we had food miles and things like this. So then we started, um, they developed adverts with um, Jamie Oliver promoting, you know, Jersey potatoes from, you know, down the road and things like that. So it's just an example of where you can get new stimulus by looking at other categories. And then the third way is through different creative exercises. So look, there's, there's hundreds or thousands of different creative exercises in the world. Um, and I tend to think they boil down to about three different types. So you've got random connections, you've got best in world, and you've got break the rules. So a good example of random connections, if you know the story of how Velcro was invented. So you had the um, Swiss engineer who was trying to find a new way, I'm not wearing a shirt today, but a new way of fastening the shirt other than using buttons. And so he has primed his brain around solving that challenge. And when he came back from walking his dog in the fields one day, he noticed the um, little like burrs or hookweed stuck onto his socks and also stuck onto his, his dog's um, fur or hair. And um, that's how Velcro was invented. So if you look at Velcro, it has a loop and it has a hook. Um, so the inspiration came from, came from nature. If we look at best in world, um, and if we look at the America's Cup and the uh, New Zealand Challenge, um, they looked at, okay, so you've got the grinders who are, you know, get the sails going up and down. And they're like, well, how else could we do that? And they're like, well, the legs are bigger muscles than, than the shoulders. So what if we literally put bikes instead of grinders on, on, on the yacht and used our legs to um, wind the sails up and down, we'd be faster and would, that'd give us a little advantage. And so that's what they did. And, and you know, the rest is history. Um, they won back the, the America's Cup. Um, and some of those cyclists they were called um, were actually even ex-Olympic um, cyclists. And then break the rules is just looking at all, you know, how is, um, what are all the rules, norms, status quo of the, of the industry? And then what if we challenge those? What if we reverse those? What if we oppose those? And you just need to look at Airbnb and um, Uber as great examples of, of challenging a, um, an industry that is, I guess, not changed in many, many years. So look, we're not gonna go and uh, do a bit of a walk out in the fields right now but I'd like to share a couple of examples around best in world and break the rules. But before we do that, um, actually we will do a little random exercise. So what, what I want you to do now is just individually, um, just to break up talking to, imagine you're in the innovation team for Nike and you have been briefed to come up with a new sports shoe, okay? Now your inspiration is the banana that you can see on the screen. And so I want you to come up with new ideas for a sports shoe, can be any type of sports shoe, using the banana as your inspiration. Okay, so we're gonna give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then as you have ideas, we want you to start posting them on comments. And um, I believe Ainsley is going to share a few of those back. So we'll give you a minute or so quiet time and then we'll, um, yeah, we'll see what everyone comes up with. There's already some early comments about the loving the colour. Okay, now, now we're getting some non-slip. Um, shoes which are easier to get on and off because you can peel them off your feet. Great for us oldies. That's a good one. Uh, natural fibres, yes, a lot, a lot on the peeling on and off concept. Gosh, I can't, I can't keep up. A, a waterproof curved sole. Oh, here's a good one. Something about vitamins. Hang on, it's moving too quickly. Shoes that infuse vitamins into your feet. That's a good one. 
slide like a pro, uh, a shoe that you can wear using different colors just by peeling off the various, the, the several covers. Uh, gosh. Non slip on the inside, no blisters. There's a bunch oh. of shoes there too, it's so quite good, so you can mix and match. A shoe that you can eat when you're hungry. <laughs> There's lots of good ideas coming through here. Holographic shoes, shoes that are fruit scented, shoes that are odor neutralizing, release lovely banana smell. I, I would beg to differ, I hate banana. Ugh. Biodegradable shoes. Everyone has some, some really good ideas. Bend it like Beckham. <laughs> oh, banana instead of the Nike logo. Yes, well. Very clever. Very clever. Have you heard those all before, Nathan, or are there some new ideas? Uh, in there? There's some new ones there, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I quite there's one there too. I saw it. It looked like it um it changed colours as it was time to change it. Um, so I went from green to yellow to black, which is quite mm, neat. That's a good one. I like it. Mm. Okay, should we carry on? That was fun. Thanks, Nathan. No problem. Okay, so what I want to share with you now is um, another creative exercise, the best in the world. So like um, the New Zealand sailing team did, you know, um, where else can we get inspiration from? So look, just share this little framework with you. Um, and what we do here is we have three columns. Who else in the world? It doesn't actually have to be the best. Who else in the world faces a problem like this? So like when I was sharing the ice cream example before, you know, who else keeps things cold really well? Principles is how do they do it? And that's where we're going to get our inspiration from. So um, steel with glee, some people talk about. And then we're going to take that principle and turn it into an idea for ourselves. So we don't just directly copy and paste. We have to do some thinking. And the example I want to give you is um, when Unilever reinvented stick deodorant. Now, I don't know what the problem was they were trying to solve, um, but we won't worry about that. We won't let that get in the way of a good example. So they wanted to reinvent stick de deodorant. So let's say they said, okay, well, who else in the world applies a substance? Yeah. So you might go, well, paint or paintbrushes, paint rollers, um, a knife, you can spread things with a knife, um, or a marker or a, a biro pen. Okay. And so we go with pen for now. And if you, if you look at a pen, I've got one here in front of me, and it has a little ball there, so it's a ballpoint pen. And that little roller applies the, the ink when you write. And so that's how they came up with roll-on deodorant um, by the Mum brand in Unilever. They got their inspiration from a ballpoint pen. So fantastic example. And what, what it shows is you can get your inspiration from anywhere. Um, so then you can come up with something new. So the next one I want to share with you is breaking the rules like um, Airbnb have done. Once again, similar framework, three columns, just slightly different headings in the first two columns. So the first one's the rules. So like I say, these are the rules. It could be regulation, but it can also just be the norms or status quo, how we've always done things, or the sacred cows. And then revolutions are where you exaggerate or pose or reverse those, and then you come up with new ideas. So let's take the um, taxi industry as an example, and let's pretend Uber hasn't been invented yet. So you write down all the rules of taxis. So, you know, when I first moved to uh, Sydney and New South Wales, you could only really book a taxi um, 15 minutes in advance. You had to wait outside your house or wherever you were for pickup. Um, and if you weren't out there, sometimes I'd toot if you're lucky. Other times I'd drive off if they had another, another um, ride waiting. You had to pay by card or cash. And then what I always used to find, especially when I was going to a client meeting, on arrival, the card machine wouldn't work. And they'd be plugging it in and then they'd be waving it out the window trying to get some sort of satellite. Meanwhile, you know, you're running late for your meeting. 
So revolutions aren't necessarily solutions in themselves. They're just like, well, what if we made it you could book any time? What if you were notified when the taxi arrived? What if you could pay seamlessly or digitally? You know, what if it was hassle-free? And, you know, you might be able, might think, well, you know, this is how Uber um, came up with what they have disrupted the taxi industry with. So, you know, you can book through an app. You've got the ETA tracking device, so you know exactly where it is. Um, payments are all cardless, not even, not even just cashless, they're cardless as well. Um, and you can get the right of your choice. So there's some examples on how we um, can get our brains to think more creatively. Because remember, they're very linear, they're very analytical. Um, if we ask for an idea, it'll go into that storage device and come up with something that's already exists. So we can trick it through creative exercises like break the rules and um, best in world. And we can trick it by going out and looking for stimulus from other industries like Sainsbury's did in the fishmonger. Um, and we can also tap into our prior experiences, but from other industries. Nathan? Yes. We have a question um, from the audience. Um, are you happy to take one now? Sure, good time. Okay. So um, a question is, do you think that COVID-19 is a time to be risk adverse and sensitive that people might be in hardship or a time to be opportunistic, ideate and commercially take advantage of the situation? Um, yes, and look, it's an interesting thought and I think you've got to be mindful and respectful of where people are at. And I saw um, something from uh, um, someone I do a lot of work with is a guy called Peter Cook. And he said, if someone's drowning, you know, don't try and throw them a yacht. <clears throat> um, and don't get in the water with them either, you know, throw them a, a, um, a lifesaver or whatever it is. It depends where they're at, you know, if they're drowning, coping or surviving or thriving, mm. how you might help that person or that customer or that client. So I would tailor your um, creativity and innovation depending on where they're at. Does that, you think that helps? Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, leading on from that, there's a more general question about how we encourage people to be more creative. Um, sometimes it's hard to convince them to get out of their comfort zone and think differently. So how can we show it, show what's in it for them? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think presentations like this can help, but also, you know, we, we, we learn by doing and we often um, change our behaviours by having a new experience. So if you can do a demonstration with them using some of these techniques, um, mm -hmm. then that might give them some inspiration. Yeah, take them along to Macquarie University's incubator. Yes, well, we're open for business. Well, I've just got a little friend come to visit me. Oh, oh cute. Yeah. He's a boy. Yeah, he's probably hungry or wants a walk. <laughs> <laughs> One more question before we move on to the next section. Um, is it possible to be creative under pressure? Oh. Um, so we're going to talk about later, you need space to be creative. Mm -hmm. If you think hard, because your brain's not really that sort of muscle that you flex. If you think hard, I don't think you're going to have an idea. Um, something else physical might happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you do need... You do need a bit of space, but yes, people do have ideas when they've got a deadline, but yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that later. Okay, sounds yeah. good. All right, that's it for now, so feel free to carry on with your friend. Right, I don't know if he's gonna be much help, he's gonna sleep. Um, so look, so we've talked about the brain, so now I wanna jump into our behaviors. Um, and look, there's a nice little quote there, you know, about what can kill an idea. And um, many of our behaviours um, do kill ideas because our business world behaviours, and I say business world, you know, it could be at university, it could be at school, it could be in society. Our business world behaviours, they're not really set up for having ideas. They're, they're more about um, making quick decisions, about judging ideas, um, there's elements of debate and criticism. Um, and the reason for this is, in the Western world, you know, why do we judge ideas so much? And maybe in the whole world. And it goes back to the Greek philosophers. Um, so, you know, thousands of years ago, I'm going to let this guy down. Thousands of years ago, um, 
you know, when we couldn't sail around the world and we thought the world maybe was flat. You had to prove your theory and your thoughts through argument. And that's how the Greek philosophers, um, you know, Socrates over, I don't know, Archimedes or whoever the other philosophers were, um, it was through debate. So as a result of that now, right through to the business world, when we have an idea, we debate it and we judge it, which isn't so useful for um, having ideas. I'll explain why. But first of all, I don't know if you've ever um, seen Sir Ken Robinson on the TED Talks. I think it's the most popular TED Talk ever. And he is hilarious um, and very intelligent. And he talks about how um, the education system needs to change so we can all be more creative. And one story he gives, which is fantastic, that talks about some like year one or two students uh, being given free time um, with some instruction to, to draw a picture, draw whatever they want. And this one little girl's drawing away and the teacher comes around, she goes, oh, Mary, what are you drawing? And Mary goes, a picture of God. And the teacher goes, but Mary, no one knows what God looks like. And the little girl goes, well, they will in a minute which is just, just fantastic, you know, because she hasn't been through school and society yet and then, you know, been judged and things like that. So um, I think back to um, when I was a little kid growing up in the country and we had a pretty big size vegetable garden and um, our parents would encourage us to, to get involved and we we're allowed to grow some things and it was normally radishes because they grow quite easily. And, um, you know, I, prepare the ground and plant the little seeds and I'd start growing like you can see on the screen. And then I'd be saying to mum or dad, well, they'd say, well, you need to start thinning them and start weeding them. And I'd go, well, which is the weed and which is the radish? Because you couldn't tell when they're so, you know, so little. And dad would say, well, you know, give them some fertilizer, which given I was growing up on a farm was cow poo. Um, water them and things like that. And I do that and then they grow, you know, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you could say with confidence that, you know, this one here is the radish and this is the weed and so you can pull the weed out. And so it's the same with ideas. In the early stage, we can't judge them. You don't know if it's a good idea or a bad one. You know, is this going to be the next Uber or, <clears throat> you know, the next iPhone? So we need to suspend our judgment, suspend our weeding, understand the idea, and then build on it or nurture it, if we want to use that analogy, until it's big enough, and then we harvest it or weed it. So, you know, next time you want to share an idea with somebody at the water cooler, say, hey, just um, pause for a minute. It's a signal that you want them to actually build on this idea with you. So suspend your judgment, um, understand the idea, and then build on it. So there are the behaviours we need to use when we're using some of those exercises we talked about before. Any, any question on behaviours? Is it a little bit quicker than the brain? Um, there is a question about measuring the effectiveness of a creative idea. Um, it might be new and in innovative, but it, they're not sure whether it might, whether it be suitable for the organisation in terms of the business. So how do you measure? The effectiveness of, an, of a creative idea? Yeah, so we, um, we quite like using the desirable, feasible, viable lenses. Um, so first of all, an idea needs to be desirable and we like to start there because the main reason ideas or innovations or startups fail is because no one wants them. But then to um, that person's question, um, it also needs to be viable. So can we make money from it or, or whatever the metric is there? Um, does it fit within budget, things like that. And then I would look at those two first and then feasible, can we make it? Um, and I wouldn't judge ideas for feasibility too soon because you might kill out some good ideas that through a lot of experimentation and you may be able to develop. And the Dyson vacuum cleaner is a great example of that. Um, I know Rob's online, he can remember how many experiments that um, Dyson, James Dyson ran, but I think it's somewhere between, it's in the thousands anyway. Yeah. Mm. Did you give the answer? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just sorry, I've lost the, the chat. Here we go. Um, should you test every idea that you brainstorm? 
Um, I don't know if it's physically possible, but no, I wouldn't think so either. You could. We we would um, we always in a workshop we'll come up with hundreds of ideas with you know with the teams. We will do, um, but that's after we've you know people have suspended, understand, and built on them in their teams. But then we'll harvest them around desirability. Yeah. Yeah. Does it meet today's core principles? Yeah. yeah. Does it meet a customer need? Is it going to excite a customer? And then we also often throw in one around um, how breakthrough is it? Yeah. Mm. So Rob has um, replied with that that number of of, of from Dyson five thousand one hundred and thirty seven apparently. Yeah. <laughs> to make that feasible. Yep. Okay. Should we jump into state? Yes, sure. So the, um, the fourth barrier, um, you know, a little bit like our behaviours, um, is our state. And so your state is how you are at any given moment. So like right now, which is hopefully, you know, alert and in interested and inspired and um, not like my dog falling asleep. Um, you may also be hungry as well. So obviously this guy here, you know, I could ask all what state's he in. And... Um, some people, some people probably have some quite interesting comments about his, his state. And uh, so you can have the best tools and techniques in the world, but if your state is stuck, if you're not in the right state, you won't come up with good ideas. So a good way of looking at it is this model by um, Chris Perez Brown, um, who's also got a book on this. Um, and he talks about how you are emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually and you know, whatever spiritually means for you. So emotionally, you know, if you're unsettled and dissatisfied and physically, if you're stressed or you know, your back's sore or you know, you're feeling cold, um, mentally you're unfocused, you know, spiritually you're disconnected from your job, you're gonna struggle to have ideas. Um, so if you're running a workshop or you're leading a team, you've really got to make sure everybody's in the right state before you jump into any sort of creativity. So look, if we're face to face, I'll get you all to um, shout out some thoughts on this, but we'll, I'll just jump to some we baked earlier. So when your state's ready for creativity, it's more like this. And you can probably associate with that. So, you know, you're excited, you're happy, you're having fun. Um, as the point before, it's quite hard to have an idea when you're being serious. Um, so have a think about these when you're setting up, if it's a workshop or a team meeting, or even if you're on your own. Am I in this state? Yeah. And you can even think about um, maybe not all the five senses, but, um, you know, when do you have your best ideas? You know, do you have any music going? What sort of food? Is it coffee? Is it wine? Um, and, you know, why, what, where, when? Um, who? So who are you with? When and where? Um, so what time of day? What time of week? Um, where are you? Things like that. And you can start um, keeping a bit of a diary when you have your best ideas. And then from that, you can work out what those triggers are. And so then you can replicate those um, triggers more often to have ideas more often. Hopefully that helps. Um, there's also some work around your brain waves and how that relates to state. So you've got Beta, when you're awake and focus, your dominant state. Alpha, when you're in deep relaxation. Um, theta, which is actually when you're getting into your subconscious. And delta, which is deep sleep. Um, so your best ideas come from alpha and theta. So um, what, uh, what's his name? Thomas Edison used to do. So the inventor of the um, light bulb or electricity. He used to um, sit himself in a, a large... He had like a metal dish and he'd hold a heavy object like a you know, big rock or a metal ball. And he would try and get into theta, into meditation. He'd primed his brain around a problem he's trying to solve. And the role of the, um, the heavy object is if he went from theta to delta, he'd obviously fall asleep and he'd drop it and go bang and he'd wake up. And so then he'd start the process over again. So um, that could be one to try this weekend maybe and see if you come up with some good ideas. But um, some others you can also do to get into, so if looking, getting into maybe more that alpha state. So we talked about this before. 
to have ideas, you need to have time and space, even a blank piece of paper. Um, you know, often people had better ideas when they were working from home rather than work. So it'd be interesting to see what that's like now, although that working from home space might be a bit more disturbed with more people sharing that space with you. Um, you've got to be your true self. So, you know, people talk about we wear a mask to work and we're not always our true selves and people are more creative at home, whether it's cooking, gardening, you know, music, whatever it is. So as team leaders and in workshops, we've got to make sure people can be their true selves. Um, Semi-automatic activities. So as you get into that alpha state, um, your subconscious can switch on because you're not, your brain's not so busy. So things like, you know, peeling the carrots, which is why I've got them on there, you can do semi-automatically. So you're not having to use 100% of your brain's capacity. So your subconscious can switch on. So it'll start trying to solve those problems that you're working on. Like, um, you know, the, the, the guy invented Velcro. So some other semi-automatic activities are going for a run, going for a walk, having a shower. Um, unfortunately, we drive semi-automatically. Um, all these different things. So you can put those into your day um, to make sure you're having good ideas. Um, so linked semi-automatic activities, you know, inspiring environments. So not only do they jolt our attention out of its normal groove, it gives you new inspiration. Um, so once again, the Velcro one, you know, got inspiration from nature. And then there's um, a couple of examples from a lady called Julia Cameron. Um, she was a, um, an artist and she was a writer, I believe. Um, but she always used to have, a, have to have a, you know, a couple of drinks of, um, of wine, not water, um, to get her creative juices going. And the um, downside of this is, you know, once she'd had a few drinks, then her creativity would drop off. Um, but unfortunately, she also became an alcoholic. So she, you know, went to AA or whatever and stopped drinking, but then she lost her creativity and couldn't write anymore. So she tried all these different techniques to get her creativity back. And um, she's since published a book now on all those techniques. And she's now creative again. And a couple of those are, um, first one's morning diaries. Every morning she'd get up and just write three or four pages of, you know, of her um, conscious thoughts. And that would almost clear the dead wood out of her brain so she had space to have new ideas. The other one she did, which is linked to some of the ones we talked about before, is take her muse and she'd call it on dates. So she'd take herself on artist dates for inspiration. Um, so whether it's, you know, going to a farmer's market, going to a different part of the city or the town or going and meeting with a different person, you know, just always filling her brain with new inspiration that she could draw on and would inspire her, her creativity. So they, they are different ways to um, change your state. But I guess the key thing is if you're ever feeling stuck, move. Yeah, go, go and do something. Um, and that often helps us get unstuck. That's what's coming through in the chat box too, Nathan. So um, my best ideas come when I'm moving or walking from Ronica. And um, Judy finds it useful to be swimming and looking at the black line on the bottom of the pool. Um, I can also relate to that one too. Um, it's about making space as well, not having the space, but making the space. And um, I know that some of my colleagues around the university have a concept of a slow day. It gets scheduled and it doesn't mean that you get in and you start just hammering out your emails and going about your, your day as normal. A slow day means you go for a walk, you think about things, you reflect and you make that space for yourself to become and think creatively. Um, so I've got to start practicing that more myself. Yeah, definitely. It's really important because we get all, we all get so busy and we just get busy doing normal business stuff, um, and responding to that and not being creative. And, and a slow day does not mean an unproductive day, um, at all. It's sometimes some of the most productive time that you can, you can have. Yeah, definitely. And I've never read it, but there's a book called Hair Brain Tortoise Mind. And it's all about, I think, that, that principle, um, you know, how the brain, when you're solving things, you know, decisions and all that, it's fast. And when you're um, solving things in terms of new ideas, it's slow. 
Okay, so we jump into the last one. So we're going to talk about space now, and um, space is actually one of the key ways, as we just covered. So what I mean by space is environment. Um, one of the key ways to affect our state. And um, you might be wondering why I've got this picture on the screen. And it's, you know, because many of our, um, our workplaces are based off the olden day sweatshops. You know, we're all lined up at desks, you know, getting work done. And your, um, your desk and your computer is um, often a good place to implement ideas. So like any of these concepts, it's not that business world behaviours and our brain and our physical environments are bad. Um, it's more that they're more conducive to getting stuff done as opposed to having ideas. Um, so you want to use space as really a lever um, to affect behaviour and state and those other things. So it should, just like the incubator at Macquarie University, it encourages creativity and collaboration, action and design doing. Um, when I went up to Stanford D School, um, a couple of the guys there, Jer Jeremy and Perry, talked about how you could knock over a pail of paint and it wouldn't matter because they really wanted to signal that failure was okay. So, you know, the, the flaws in that weren't too pristine. Um, and on that study tour around Silicon Valley, every single organisation we visited had a designated prototyping space. And by prototyping, you know, we meant scrapping materials and things like that. Um, from another piece of research from Stanford, they um, identified that in, in our offices and, you know, in our universities and schools and things, we want acoustic, not visual separation. So, um, you know, we're all open plan these days, but it doesn't give us that acoustic separation. Um, you know, we actually need quiet, or at least, you know, fairly quiet to be able to think but we still want to see each other. So they designed a lot of their offices around that. Um, in a space where you can show up and be your true self, um, which, you know, once again, the uh, flexi working and hot desking is a little bit hard when you, you know, you don't have anything on your desk that's, that's about you because you're at a different desk every day. But that's, that's a challenge that we have to face and, you know, it's a challenge that's not going to go away. And I think after COVID-19, you know, more and more workplaces will be moving to hot desking because more and more people will be working from home. Um, so, you know, there's pros and cons for everything. So, look, that's, um, that's the five barriers to creativity, you know, whether it's individually or teams and in workshops and, and some tools and techniques for, for um, recognising them and, and overcoming them. Um, so, look, open, open for any, any questions. Um, yeah, Nathan, I'd just, just say thank you, Nathan, for that. That was really awesome. Um, I just thought I had a couple of takeouts that I thought might be worth, you know, everyone following up on. And I think um, look for inspiration from everyone around you and look at how you may help that um, in others as well. I think supporting people through having their ideas is really important and all of us play a role in that. Um, to support people. Watch Sir Ken Robinson, amazing, amazing person. Um, look for desirable first, then viable, then feasible um, in, in your path to developing your ideas. Be open and kind to others' ideas. Help nurture them as you never know where they may go, um, which is a credo that we live by at the incubator. And um, where are you or what are you doing when you have your best ideas? Notice your state and use that to your creative advantage. So there's some, some key points that I took away from that and will be doing myself. So thank you very much, Nathan. Um, any questions we have for, for Nathan there? Ainsley, I think there's probably heaps. Yeah, there's one I missed earlier on. It touched on another question um, that we had in the first part. But how people really want to know how how do you encourage people to get out of their comfort zone i think nathan you said that you've got to enable them to have an experience but but how do we convince people that you know go do this yeah yeah sorry i was just reading a comment about someone yeah. going to the last slide but how do, how do we how do we encourage people to do this um to get out of the comfort zone yeah yeah, look, it's, it goes back to those experiences and, and um, maybe it seems too easy to say. So it's giving, it's working people up to it. So giving them a taster. Um, you know, this was what, a 40 minute chat. Um, you know, giving them a taster of it. 
you know, a brainstorm doesn't have to be all day or two days. I'm not saying a brainstorm's the only way to be creative, but yeah, setting up time, give them a bit of a taster. Yeah, and then we've got here, the best way is to lead by example. How can we ask people to do things we aren't prepared to do ourselves? I think that's really important. So thanks, Ronica, for that. Um, what else have I missed? Oh, a plug about your book, Nathan, Judy's read it. It's very readable and practical while being underpinned well by his research and experiences. And so she would recommend that. Um, so a question from Abby, do you believe in what is called a creative, the creative block? And if so, how, do, how would you overcome it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there's, um, there's different times of the day and, you know, maybe different times of the week or whatever where you, where you struggle to have ideas. And I, I think that one links back to, um, there's a number of ways of solving it, but one of them is links back to state. So if you've got that creative block, you're stuck. So you need to you need to do something. You need to move, um, and that could be going to a different environment. I used to you know love going to cafes, you know order my flat white, um, often get a muffin as well, um, <laughs> and you know there's that level of noise in a cafe. It's at that right level of white noise, so you can have ideas and it's not too loud. Because I actually struggle with loud noise to work, but that so that that works for me. Um, I used to work from a cafe too, Nathan, um, and apparently when I stopped working from a cafe, someone told me that there was an app that you could run in the background with all that cafe noise, so I'm sure that there's an app for everything. Yeah, and then the other one would be, so that's your state, you've got to do all, you've got to overcome all five barriers, and then the other one, some of those techniques, um, if you, you know, you, if you know what your problem is, because you've got to define it first, then go, well, who else in the world solves something like this? And we've mm. already seen that roll on deodorant, you know, came from the biro pen. So, yeah. Yeah. I think there's an interesting question here too. Um, creativity without a good business plan is, is possible. Is that possible? Question mark. Maybe creativity is not enough. What are the three most important things for you? Yeah, I think it's good. Like, um, you know, this is oversimplifying it, but ideas plus action equals innovation. You know, creativity without action, you know, is fun or something like that. Um, you know, today we just focus on creativity, but yeah, there's a lot you need to do to to um, then make your idea happen. So yeah, I agree. You need both. And um, one more here: is crea is the creative state sustainable as like a as a permanent state? Um, look, I'm not an expert in in um, that sort of thing, but I, I, my gut feel would be no. Like any state, you know, you get to exhaustion. Mm. Um, you know, we all need to switch off. We all need to do different things. Um, the creative state is quite a relaxed state, though. Um, it's probably unrealistic, you know. Um, yeah, it's my yeah. gut feel. Yeah, sure. Okay, have I missed any there, Melissa? I don't think so. I think that every, all of us just have to look around us for inspiration if we want it um, and look at how you can um, apply that to a problem you have, particularly from different situations. I love the biomimicry stuff around Velcro. Um, I think that there's so much that surrounds us every day that can solve some of our greatest problems. It's just having the ability to be open and also for people and institutions to support the creative state. I think that often that's what a lot of people have said in, in the commentary, that they find that it's, it's often something that they, they, that's not supported um, and also in highly matrix organisations um, that are highly structured, often if you're not senior and you don't have someone to help you and get your opinion across, then often you just get lost. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Hey, look, at yeah, just a little plug on the book since um, someone asked. So, look... Um, I've left the link up there. You, it's look the recommended retail is thirty four ninety five. Um, you can get it in, as they say, all good bookstores, um, both physical and online. Um, and maybe look your favourite little bookstore down the road or in the village needs some support right now. Give them a call. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you can go to my website. You can get it there for a discount if you want as well. So look, whatever, if you want to copy whatever you know fits with your heart and and and. Uh, there's someone you want to support, yeah, go and get it from them by yeah. all means. Thank you so much, Nathan. And we are looking forward to collaborating with you um, further in the NOS2 distant future. Excellent.
Yeah, thanks, Nathan. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, a great first virtual event for us. And we'll be rolling these out monthly. Um, so please uh, sign up to our newsletter to stay up to date with um, all our activities and programs. If you are a Macquarie student, please um, definitely keep your ear close to the ground in terms of the programs that we'll soon be rolling out. Very, very exciting. Um, would love for you to get involved. Um, and more generally, um, welcome to our uh, Macquarie University incubator community and we hope to see you all again here uh, soon. Thank you. Cool. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Nathan. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you.